Stop it. Don't open that door. I am the one who knocks. The 90s, such a lovely time, a time of change, a time where new things were created. It was like a hundred years ago. The music industry experienced many new genres and subgenres. The Simpsons were still kind of new and good. Some idiots were complaining about violence in video games and thinking it would turn children into psychotic killers. At least that's what I've heard. I don't know. I still didn't exist in the early 90s. First person shooters were still developing. Doom's Daddy, Wolfenstein 3D came out and... Well, it doesn't really hold up today, but it's really important in gaming history. And of course you get to kill Hitler. What more do you need? But just like the term first person shooter wasn't invented yet, the same could be said about the term survival horror. Because Resident Evil wasn't created yet. And just like Wolfenstein was the prototype for Doom, there was a game that would become the prototype for Resident Evil. A game that also, like Wolfenstein, doesn't really hold up very well today, but was instrumental for the gaming industry. And that game is... Together in the Light. Um, I mean, Alone in the Dark. No, not that one. I'm the Light Bringer! The fucking universe! Oh boy, oh boy. We'll get there soon enough. But not today. Today we're talking about the original, the classic, Alone in the Dark from 1992. It's uh it's not a train wreck like the one from 2008, but you'll see. The remake for Alone in the Dark is coming out soon. It was supposed to be out already, but they decided to delay it to January of next year. And like in the Resident Evil remakes, the developers seem to take the original concept and make their own story. We'll see how faithful it is to the original. And also like in the Resident Evil remakes, we will play this game from a third person perspective, instead of a fixed camera. I'm actually really excited about it, because one of the writers for this game is the dude that wrote the stories for the first Amnesia and Soma, which has one of the best stories ever told. It looks really good. So I thought that this would be a perfect time to go back and play the original that started it all. Especially because I never actually played this game. I tried playing it, like, more than a decade ago, but I thought that this game was weird. And I dropped it. You'll see what I mean. I did have a physical copy of the fourth game, which I also didn't finish. Yep, still have it. We'll get to this one too, eventually. So there was this company called Infograms, and one employee asked, Hey, you know about Resident Evil? To which another employee replied, No, I don't. Because it's 1992, it wasn't created yet. So they decided to create it themselves. But instead of fighting zombies, you fight Cthulhu's minions. Stop showing up in my videos, Cthulhu. According to Wikipedia, this game was initially supposed to play out much differently. You'd have to use matches to gain snapshot views of a completely dark environment, which is basically what you do in Fatal Frame, but with a camera. A game that would come out nine years later. Frederick Reynal, a programmer at Infograms, was a really big horror fan. So he was like, yo, I'll be the lead designer and I'll make all of your fancy 3D animations. Supposedly he met his wife while they both worked on the game. Which is a really wholesome story that you don't expect to hear as part of a survival horror game. Also, I just quickly wanted to say thanks for all the support on my previous video. It got like 10,000 views and it's still growing, which is massive for me. I read your comments and I really appreciate all of the kind messages. It means a lot. Even the one about my accent. I almost started blushing. Okay, let's get back to Alone in the Dark. I'm going to compare this game to Resident Evil for obvious reasons. So you will be hearing the words 
Resident Evil a lot. But before we can even talk about the story and the gameplay, we have to make some tweaks. Because when you first start the game, it looks like this. Not exactly ideal. Thankfully, it's easy to fix. And there are many guides on how to do it. You go to the folder, open this file, go here, change the resolution according to your screen, save the file, and boom. Just like in Resident Evil, I told you I would be saying that a lot, we need to choose between two characters, Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood. I'm going to pick the man, because I'm a manly man myself, so I can't choose a female. I'm kidding, I just like his mustache. They both need to go into a spooky mansion, but they have different reasons for going there. The first thing you'll notice after you start the game is the voice acting. There's barely any voice acting, but what's in here is actually really good. On my door, a dull brass plate says Private Detective. The few friends I have call me Carnby. The others call me The Reptile. It also sounds way better than anything else at the time. At least from what I know. Voice acting in video games wasn't... Uh, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't the best. That's right. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant! <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it! This is the inside of a police station. The laser controls and my notes are on the science level and the override codes in the science library. I have no idea how you're gonna do all this, but good luck. Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! Ouch! Anyway, there was this guy, Jeremy Hartwood, who died in his own mansion. Emily wants to investigate what happened, because he was her uncle, and she probably cared for him. But Edward is a shady private investigator, who just does it for the money. Typical man, am I right? He was sent to this mansion to find a piano. What I was asked to do was visit a property called Dersetto and find a piano in the loft. Luckily, devil worship makes me smile. So, this is my idea of a paid vacation. The first thing you'll notice is obviously the graphics. Yeah, I don't think they hold up really well. A controversial hot take, but these graphics are not good by today's standards. But back then, they were good. These games are getting really realistic. Uh, okay, not that good. Just ignore the... What is that? What is that? It looks more terrifying than the monsters in this game. Just ignore the fact that it looks like a redhead origami monster. I really like this opening because you basically go through the entire game, but backwards. You can see the journey ahead and you get to see the cool fixed camera perspectives. I think people shit on fixed cameras too much nowadays. Everyone says that they only used fixed cameras back in the day because of the limited technology. And that's partly true, but it also has a unique style and you can make a game really cinematic with fixed cameras. You feel like you're in an actual movie. You will realize soon enough that you've made a horrible mistake. You shouldn't have come here. The doors lock behind you. You are trapped here with forces beyond your control. Nah, I'm sure it will be fine. Okay, finally we get to the gameplay. And yes, there are 10 controls here, which takes some time getting used to, but it's okay. People are shitting on 10 controls way too much. Just like with fixed cameras, you just need some time to get used to them and then you can finally explore this place and... What's that? Oh, shit! Yes, not even 20 seconds into the game and already I'm attacked by a big duck? This game is supposed to be inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu stories. I don't remember there being ducks in Lovecraftian stories. You barely have any time to play and already you are attacked by an enemy. Which is not the most convenient way of starting a video game. Not really fair, I would say. I mean, games back then started throwing enemies at you pretty quickly. Which is great, but even in those old games where you get to the action fast, you usually had some time to figure out the controls. You always have a certain period of time where you are safe from enemies and you can learn the controls and experiment. It's something that we take for granted because we're so used to it, we don't even think about it. But it's probably the one thing that is common across literally any game that existed and will exist. And I'm not even talking about having a dedicated tutorial of the game explaining how to walk or shoot or something like that. Basically in any game you have a safe area in the beginning, no matter what genre of game we're talking about. 
and even in games where you are put into the action right away, it's always against low level enemies that will probably won't kill you. And even if they will, it will take them a long time. And the game tells you exactly what to do in order to deal with them. But when you start alone in the dark, just forget everything that I said. You barely have 10 seconds to breathe and then boom, an enemy shows up. At least after you deal with it, you can finally rest. Except you can't, because a few seconds later, a zombie comes out of the floor. I think it's a bit too much for the opening section. Okay, so how do you actually fight these guys? I guarantee that the combat system will sound cool for those who haven't played this. You don't just attack in one way, you can attack in three different ways. Each attack has a different speed and does different amounts of damage. At least that's what I think. You can do a fast attack, you can do a slow but more powerful attack, you can do an attack that is somewhere in the middle. And it's the same with every melee weapon that you pick up. It also means that you won't get bored by looking at the same attack animation over and over again. So there's a lot of variety. Sounds good, right? Well, this is how it actually looks. This is probably the goofiest combat I've ever seen in any game. Also, look at his stance. Hmm, yeah. Don't mess with me, bucko, or you shall get a proper S weapon. Basically, there's only one strategy to fighting these enemies. There's only one thing that you need to know. Either you hit them first and you stun like them to death, or they hit you first and stun like you to death. As you can see, this is a bit inconvenient. You see this? This is 95% of the combat in this game. Yeah, look at that. 1992 kick. Die, you dastardly villain. Oh, he turned into bubbles. That's a... Uh, what? So it's not the best combat, to say the least. And it's really not the best way to start a video game. When you barely have time to breathe and get a grasp on the controls, and the game immediately throws two enemies at you. There is something cool that you can do. You can push this closet to block the window and you can push the chest to block this entrance, or just stand on it. That way, the enemies won't be able to enter, and you will be safe. Which is really cool that you can do that, but there's no way you would know all of this on your first playthrough. You can also just break the window yourself, and stun like him before he can even attack. Okay, now we can finally explore this place. Our goal was to find a piano, right? We will probably only find it, like, towards the end or something. Nope, there it is. Well, that was easy. All we had to do was kill some duck and a zombie. Good detective work. Let's go home. Yeah, we can't leave. We're trapped in this mansion until we figure out what's going on and uncover its secrets. Fine, let's explore. If you will ever play this game and you won't give up after experiencing this amazing combat system, then you might give up here because you'll try interacting with stuff, but nothing will happen. You'll just raise your fists and it will look like you really want to fight this closet. You can't just interact with stuff by using the interact button. What you need to do is press enter on your keyboard, select action and choose the option to search. And now when you press the use button, which is space, instead of looking like you want to give someone a proper beatdown, you will look more like you're an old person looking for their medication. Oh my hip! But you will be able to interact with objects in the world. You can also pick up certain items just by walking on them. I feel like we've been in this attic for too long. Let's explore the rest of this house. Remember how like a minute ago, enemies ambushed us and we barely had any time to breathe? This happens again. In fact, this happens all of the time. You are almost never safe in this game. The battle music got stuck in my head after listening to it so many times. Ah. 
The music and sound effects in this game are quite good. There are some atmospheric songs here, but the battle song is what sticks out the most for me. But that could just be because of Stockholm Syndrome. Every time you enter a new area, expect something bad to happen to you. This game can be relentless with its enemies. You're just exploring, then BAM! Enemy jumping from the window. At least when you kill all of the enemies, you're safe to explore this place. More like safe to explore your death. Everything wants you dead. Not just the enemies. Literally everything. The floor wants to kill you. Barrels want to murder you. Even fucking cigarettes are trying to kill you. Which is actually the most realistic thing in this game. But usually in real life, they kill you slowly throughout the years. And not instantly by making everything black and white. Even when you think that you're smart, by discovering a secret passage, you're still punished. <laughs> Oh, come on! What is this? Ah. But as annoying as this game can be, it has backflipping rats, so it's all good. Also, if you're tired of walking slower than a thousand-year-old turtle, you can actually run in this game. You do look like a drunk person looking for the toilet, but at least you have infinite stamina. Just double tap the forward arrow and you're good to go. Yes, you use arrows in this game. No WASD for you. Needless to say, this game can be very frustrating. It's a sequence of trial and error. The biggest suggestion I can give you is save every time you make any progress. And I mean any progress. Thank God it's not like Resident Evil and you can save whenever you want. Yes, I finally found a melee weapon. Watch out, foul beast. I'm going to slice you up and... What the fuck? What the fuck? I know I'm shitting on this game a lot, but there are good things here. Even small things that most people will probably ignore. For example, I like how at first it just says a key, but after you use it on a chest, it changes to the chest's key. Nice attention to detail. Okay, let's get going. What the fuck is this? Um, I'm just gonna go this way. Oh, they're not actually fighting me. They're just standing there, menacingly. It's easy to hit them, but I don't know if it does anything. Ouch. Clearly this isn't working. Eventually I got bored and wanted to see what happens if you die, so I let them kill me. Um... Am I being sacrificed? Did that zombie drag me all the way here? That's some good workout for him. After exploring a bit more, we find a mirror and use it on these statues, which makes the gargoyles go senile and attack the air in front of them, and then they die. A simple solution, right? Why do they sound like the best cry ever? Okay, new area. <laughs> Who's laughing at me? Yeah, of course it's locked. Maybe I can... Oh, what now? Like I said, you are always in danger. This house will be your tomb if you're not careful. You will also feel lost and confused quite often. But like in most horror games, you can find clues by reading notes. Only this game did what many survival horror games do, but it actually did it right. Pretty much every survival horror game tells a lot of its story through notes, but you know, stopping what you're doing every time you want to read something is boring, and it slows down the pace in games that are already slow paced. And it's even worse because sometimes you have to read them, because there's some information or clue on how to proceed. Here, there's voice acting, which makes it way more tolerable, especially because it's so dramatic. Listen to this. Some, seeing my recent paintings may question my sanity. I can only ask them, what is sanity? Where does madness begin? I cannot paint. My pictures are clearly the work of a lunatic. Now what can you see? The companions of Zeus' sons laughed. Let us set to work. The night is pitch black. I am again drenched in sweat. I feel like my grandfather is reading me a bedtime story. Some children showed one their queer hands. 
Let's talk about the story some more. The more you explore this place, the more you'll discover what truly happened here. Obviously, all of this isn't normal, at least I hope it's not. Maybe this is just another normal day for rich people with mansions. But anyway, you eventually discover that a long time ago, there was a weird pirate here who performed some spooky rituals and communicated with the old ones. Kind of like the old gods from Fear and Hunger. Classy gentlemen like Cthulhu, Dagon, and Shab Nigura. You know, all of the Chads from H.P. Lovecraft's stories. They're even mentioned in books that you find. You can even find the Necronomicon. Do not read the Necronomicon. Inominandum signa stellarum nigrarum et Even reading books can kill you in this game. So it's a good thing we have audiobooks now. Use code AUDIBLE to get 10% off your next perch. I'm kidding, this isn't sponsored. Yet. Some time after performing his satanic rituals, the pirate was shot and he presumably died. All of this is somehow connected to the zombies, the ducks, that thing in the bathtub. <coughs> How did he hit me from there? And also this creature that just sits there. Is it even alive? Oh god, it's alive. Do not touch it. It kind of looks like that thing from Fear and Hunger 2. That thing that goes deep inside of your... Whatever is causing all of this mess needs to be stopped. And not because you're some big macho hero with a fancy mustache, but because you want to get out of here and get paid. But every time you try to progress, something always happens. You can't even cross a hallway without getting attacked by pictures who throw axes and arrows at you. Homing axes and arrows. Even the pictures hate you. I think it's a good time to talk about the puzzles. As much as this game inspired future horror titles and basically created the survival horror genre, it's more of a puzzle adventure game. Sure, Resident Evil and other horror games also had loads of puzzles, but here it feels like you have to solve a puzzle in every room, while you can figure out what to do by reading the various notes and books scattered around. There will be times when you will be stuck in a trial and error loop. I tried to avoid a guide as much as possible, but sometimes I just said fuck it and looked it up. It feels like cheating, but in this game, Come on, sometimes if you read everything and pay close attention, you will figure out the solution to a problem. But a lot of the times, the solution is more based on just trying random shit, like early on. There's something that you need to open, but you can't, it's locked. You've picked up every item available to you. So that's it, game over. I guess you're stuck here forever, bye. Or at least that's what you think. Until you realize that by selecting the random vase that you picked up earlier, you can choose to throw it, which causes the vase to break, which then gives you the opportunity to pick up the key that was inside. You then use that key to unlock what you needed earlier, and now you can progress. And it's this trial and error philosophy that can be very frustrating at times, but also kind of rewarding, because it feels good to figure out this shit by yourself. I'm not saying that this was some brilliant moment, all I did was chuck a vase like a caveman, but you know what I mean. You try out things that you might not be used to in other video games, but they do kind of make sense. You picked up something, maybe there's something inside. And yes, there's an inventory system, which lets you discard items and put them on the ground, and they actually stay there forever. If you try to take out things from your inventory in Resident Evil, they just magically disappear. I get why they did it, I get the gameplay reason but it's still bullshit. I guess you could put things in Resident Evil Zero, but we don't talk about that game. Alone in the Dark even did the inventory management thing before Resident Evil. It's not as organized like in Resident Evil, but at least here you have more than 8 storage places, and the small key doesn't take as much space as a goddamn shotgun. At first I was under the impression that you had infinite storage, until I tried to pick up the statue and the game told me, no, fuck off, so I had to put some stuff away. Pro tip, throw everything that you don't need, everything. Just put it down, but don't be an idiot like me and put it next to a doorway, put it somewhere in the corner. That way you won't get 20 pop-up messages asking you to pick up the shit that you don't need. Remember those pictures that kill you? Guess how you need to deal with them. Go ahead, guess. Is it A. 
pulling the pictures out from the wall, B. Drawing some dicks on them to, to distract them, or C. Performing an ancient ritual where you talk to Dagon and tell him about your secret fetishes. Write your answers in the comments section below. Did you do it? Did you guess? Well, you are wrong. What you need to do is find an Indian carpet, put it on this picture, run all the way to this spot in this hallway, and shoot the other picture with an arrow, which is not an easy thing to do, because the aiming here is not the best, and you only have three arrows. So again, I suggest you save your game before doing this. In general, save your game every 10 seconds. I don't know why you can't just shoot it with a gun, but I suppose Edward wants to kill it with an arrow because it tried to kill him with an arrow. And this is some kind of twisted revenge. We keep going and hey, this is actually kind of cute, kind of wholesome. Fuck, 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 fuck. After exploring and dying some more, you come across a pirate. Arr, arr. It's the ghost of the pirate who wanted to sleep with Cthulhu, the one who performed all of the spooky rituals. And we can't kill him, no matter how hard we try. We try to whack him, he dodges. We try to shoot him, he dodges. And he does it in a smug way too. <laughs> now listen here, Mr. Fancy Pants. Just because you're an immortal spooky pirate ghost doesn't mean that you need to laugh at me while jumping like the world's gayest ballerina. The only way to kill this bastard is by using this sword. So I'll just take it and... You know, if guns don't work, the only logical thing to do is to obviously pick up this big ass statue and throw it on his STUPID FACE. Okay, now we can finally kill this bastard. You're mine now, Captain Poopy Pants. Prepare to meet your... Oh. Goodbye, Captain. It was an honor. Now turn into bubbles. To be honest, I'm not even sure you need to kill him. All he gives you is a key that leads you to an area that you've already explored. And no, you can't use the broken sword from earlier on him. You have to use this one for some reason. Speaking of which, I know I told you to throw away anything that you don't need, but do not throw away this sword, even if it is broken. Do not throw it away. You need it to open a secret passage, because of course this place has a secret passage. Okay, this is new. Is this some kind of cave? Whoa, 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 whoa! Well, I'm not going back that way. At least now I'm safe. This is actually very atmospheric. All I hear are my footsteps in this creepy fleshy tunnel. Come on! There's always something. Is this a chase sequence in a 1992 game? Whoa, are you crazy? Can't you see the giant monster behind us? Get out of the way! At least I have infinite stamina, which is actually surprising. You'd think that maybe in a game like this, you wouldn't be able to sprint for this long. But what does it matter? Of course we fucking die eventually. What we actually need to do is outsmart this creature by going back and turning right. I'm not sure what the point of this cutscene is, but it looks kind of sad. Good. Fuck you. Wee. Okay, new area. Oh, what is that? Come here, I'm not afraid of you. Oh shit, I fell. Okay, I am afraid. I am afraid of you. What are you doing to me? Oh. Oh, no. I feel violated. Oh. Oh god, no. Ah. These are supposed to be the deep ones. You know, the terrifying monstrosities from H.P. Lovecraft stories. But here it's... <laughs> ah, what the fuck. Aside from the sexual harassment part, they are very goofy. Oh shit, there's another one. Fuck that. Oh, what is this shit now? That's what you'll be asking yourself for at least 90% of this game. Oh, what is this shit now? There are enemies that you only see like once or twice and then you never see them again. Which is true for most of the enemies here. No flying allowed. 
This is a weird part, weirder than usual I mean, because you obviously can't move forward until you realize that you suddenly have the ability to jump, which is something you could not do before. And then you play the worst platformer ever. Yeah, I don't know why they created this part, but hey, this is probably the scariest part yet. And yes, I say it after every successful jump. Now we get to a crossroads. Let's go here. And second thought, let's go over there. Yeah, this is better. Not creepy at all. Okay, this is the scariest part. Good luck trying to figure out which direction Edward is facing. Before, he just looked like a giant pixel. Now, he looks like a tiny pixel. Did I mention that this game has tank controls? Meaning that if you want to jump forward, you need Edward to look forward. If he looks slightly to the left or to the right, he will fall. Eventually, we finally cross this horrible bridge section and we find a spooky gem and go into another creepy cave. And now, we get to a truly terrifying part. You have to navigate this creepy labyrinth. Your lamp barely illuminates you. This, this is when you realize that you are truly alone in the dark. Only you, your tiny lamp and the voices of your footsteps. This is my favorite part of the game. We progress through the darkness and we use the gem we found earlier. Exit in the darkness, we arrive at a tree. This is kind of beautiful. Seeing something like this after the darkness and all of the horrible things we've been through is nice. It's relaxing. But this is alone in the dark. This game hates us. It hates you. It hates me. It even hates your grandparents and even your great great grandparents. So of course, the tree shoots fireballs. Every tree does that. It's normal. So the logical thing to do is to run straight at it, take its hook, put a magical talisman where the hook was, realize that the tree is actually an ugly pirate, throw the lamp at its stupid face and then run away as he burns in agony. I guess that was the final boss? Also the tree can hit Killer Croc, which is funny. Hey, this is where the zombie dragged me like a hundred times every time I died. So yeah, that person inside of the tree, that was the pirate that flirted with the old ones, the one who performed the rituals. Turns out that by performing these rituals, he gained supernatural powers. So after he was shot, he used those powers to combine himself with a tree, which kept him alive. He also gained the ability to summon spooky monsters and is the reason for everything we've been through in this game. His name is Ezekiel Pregzd. 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 And his tree form is based on the H.P. Lovecraft story, The Tree, which is a story about a spooky tree. That is all. As powerful as he is, he is still stuck inside of a tree, so he cannot unleash his evil into the outside world. He is limited to this mansion. That's why he wants us dead. He wants his minions to bring our body to him, so he could take control of it, which would allow him to leave this place and take over the planet, or something like that. But all of that doesn't matter, because we burn his tree hugging ass. After running back the way we came from, we're finally back in the mansion. There are no enemies anymore. We have purged all evil from this foul place. A guy with this face defeated an ancient evil tree pirate. If you really want to, you can explore this place in peace and really appreciate all of the work and effort that was put into it, which is cool I guess. Time to say goodbye to this place. We had fun together. I'll miss you. No, actually I won't. I'm happy to leave. Look at my happy face. It's time to get paid. Hmm, driver, after I get my money, please drive me to the local brothel so that I may enjoy some fine bitches. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that was the goofiest ending I've ever seen. Did Edward just kept riding with the zombie? without saying anything? Where was the zombie up until now? Was it driving my car all of this time? I guess we'll never know.
Wait, wasn't I supposed to look for some piano? There was one in the beginning, but I didn't do anything with it. Oh well, this was a really short game. It took me like 3 hours to beat, and that's only because I tried not to use a guide as much as possible. But that's not a bad thing, it's as long as it needed to be. Which is what your girlfriend says, to try and comfort you. But naturally, I did look at a guide a few times, because this game can be a bit confusing, to say the least. Before we had the Spencer mention, zombies, and even the idea of a survival horror game, we had this, a pretty small and annoying, but very impressive and innovative game that was quite ahead of its time, about a spooky Lovecraftian mansion and a tree-hugging ghost pirate. I wanted to end the video here, but as I was finishing the script for this video, I thought to myself, man it was really interesting playing this game. I got to experience a historic piece of gaming history, but I did suffer a lot, so why not play the sequels? What's the worst that can happen? So that's what I did. I've played and finished Alone in the Dark 2 and Alone in the Dark 3, and also another little game. I wanna talk about them, and show you why they are uh, special in more than one way. That's right, this is a triple feature, a review, or analysis, or walkthrough, or whatever you want to call this, of the entire original trilogy. The sequels are pretty much the same as the original, in terms of mechanics, so I will mainly talk about the story, and the uh, bullshit. Lots and lots of bullshit, you'll see. You will see. When starting alone in the dark too, you'll notice that everything is still pixelated, but there's more... life put into it? Everything feels more lively. How do you think the sequel to the game that basically invented the survival horror genre starts? It's going to be like the first game, but even creepier, right? Think about it for a few seconds. Now, take whatever you were thinking about and flush it down the toilet, because you are wrong! Probably. This is nothing like you think it is. Or at least it's nothing like I thought it would be. Look at this opening cutscene. 22nd of December, 1924. Oh, oh, look at him go! Is that a zombie with a tummy gun? Look at him go! Ah! Where are your eyes? Ah, the classic. The old pretending to sleep for two seconds clown technique. I use it every day. Either characters don't have eyes, or they have huge anime eyes. There's a different version of this game where she looks like this. But we don't talk about that. We will never talk about that. Uh. I didn't know the Joker was in this game. <laughs> Did the Joker die from a cup of water? And who the fuck is this lady? At first, I only wanted to briefly mention these games, but there is so much to talk about here. Welcome! to the goofy zone. This game has a more goofy tone. The first game was also kind of silly, but here the silliness is much more prevalent. As you can probably see, this doesn't look like a spooky horror game anymore. It looks more like a weird James Bond knockoff.
This game as a whole has a more action feel to it. It's weird and unexpected. I thought this was supposed to be the prototype to Resident Evil. It's like if Wolfenstein 3D was the prototype to Doom, but then it would have a sequel that would have an entirely different feeling to it. Like, instead of staying a fast-paced shooter, it suddenly became similar to Call of Duty. Oh wait, one of the characters is literally named Striker. You can't get more action-y than this. That's a name for like an action character. Or a Mortal Kombat character. Edward himself looks like a spy sent by the government. He even came prepared with a fucking exploding briefcase. <laughs> Just like in the first game, you don't really get a chance to breathe and you immediately need to fight some enemies. Look at his moves though, this time he doesn't look like he wants to give someone a proper gentleman's beating. He fights like a skilled and deranged fighter. He even uses headbutts. Now call me crazy, but I think that if you want your game to be scary, you shouldn't give your character the ability to headbutt a motherfucking zombie with a tummy gun. Yeah, this is... this is going to be special. Morning, sir. Also, what happened to your mustache? He doesn't look like Edward from the first game. He looks more like his rebellious son. Oh, and don't try to leave, because then you'll be living with the fishes. Right off the bat, I want to mention something really positive about this game. The biggest innovation ever. Thankfully, this game doesn't have the problem of having hundreds of items that you don't need that clutter your inventory. You don't need to make a nice pile of junk like in the first game. I'm not sure if you have infinite storage or if you just don't pick up that many items, but I never had an inventory problem here. Also, key items disappear from your inventory after you use them. Like, if you use a key to a door, it disappears, which is fucking great. It seems like the developers learned from their past mistakes, but not entirely, because of course, our best friend, Stunlocking, is back, back with a vengeance, because this time enemies have guns, and they can shoot you from across the screen, meaning you will get hit by enemies that you haven't even seen yet, and get stunlocked. This is even worse than being as blasted by the cultists in blood. Modern oxen fear books! You can try to run away, but that's not the most reliable strategy. But then I found out that it's exactly what you're supposed to do. You see that group of armed zombies? You don't need to run away from them. You need to run straight at them. Hope that they do not turn you into Swiss cheese and then go here and wait for this to happen. The game only started and I don't know what's going on. I'm in a sewer and I lost all of my weapons. I thought this was weird, like the game was punishing me for trying out this random tactic, like I'm not supposed to go here. So I decided to try a different strategy. What you are actually supposed to do is go here, push the statue, fight like a gajillion zombies inside of a hedge maze, pray that you will stun like them before they will stun like you, this is a good place to do it, then you move on, you do not touch any of the cards except this one, solve a bunch of puzzles, find a special sword, fight these leafy hands, fight a pirate zombie with a gun in his leg, use the hook and this thing, open the secret passage and then finally you get to the same place you were before. So you do need to go here. All of this was pointless. And don't think that it might be worth doing all of that because you get some new weapons or something. No matter what, you lose all of your weapons when you fall down here. So yeah, doing all of that was completely pointless. Oh no, they killed that guy that we came here to save. So... Can I go home now? He left us a note before he died. Carnby. If you read this, it means I am dead. 
The Saunders child was kidnapped by one-eyed Jack, despite what the newspaper claimed. That man is a monster, obsessed with gambling and death. Ah, fine. I'll go rescue the little girl. The dramatic reading is back, but now there's also a pirate voice, because on top of gangster zombies, there are pirates again. Yeah, this is quite bonkers. In 1717, he was found and brought aboard the Jolly Roger by One-Eyed Jack. Never, never, never shall be slaves still echoed in the air when the dark horse blew up. Danny Boy had tried to extinguish the fuse by spitting on it. Captain Prigg's orders rang out about the howling of the tempest. Do as he says. They were accused of raiding Madame Jojo's gambling house. It seems the voice actors had more fun this time around. That's nice. You know what's not nice? Really not nice? Making important items the size and color of a one millimeter floor tile. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks, guys. I actually really like the next puzzle. There's a key on the other side of the door, so you need to use a pipe cleaner to make it fall. But then you wouldn't be able to get it, so you use a newspaper before you use the pipe cleaner to make it fall on the newspaper, so you can drag it to your side of the door. Thankfully, you cannot soft lock yourself by just using the pipe cleaner. The key only falls after you use the newspaper. Hey, who's that guy? Hey, you. The zombies can talk? Get out of here! You look like a piece of poo that's being flushed down the toilet. What does this do? Wait, didn't I just throw him down to the bottom of the sea? How is he here? And what's with the peaceful music playing while I'm being plunged to my death? Let's use this thing to our advantage this time. Let's use it to push him. It didn't work. Unless we use a bag we found earlier and jump scale him. Hi, guy. Ha, <laughs> yes, it actually worked. That is so juvenile. There's a lot of weird and creative puzzles here. Some are optional like this one, but they're so goofy. I already accepted that this isn't a survival horror game, but it's okay. The comedic elements of this game makes me kind of love it. I also love the small animations that play out when you use certain items. I really like them. That is all. Remember how I said this game is way goofier than the first one? If you weren't convinced yet, here's a zombie with an accordion. Why? Why is there a zombie with an accordion? I don't fucking know. No, wait, he actually has some lore, some backstory. By this pact signed by me, Sean O'Leary, called Music Man, and Elizabeth Jarrett, arm of the evil powers, I'm granted immortality. This pact is renewable every 100 years. He just casually talks about his immortality, but I think he got scammed, because even though he claims to be immortal, you can still kill him, or even better, tear this note in front of him. Then he just dies on his own. Also, every time I pause the game, a rat shows up here. How did I get from a haunted mansion to fighting gangster zombies? After finally killing these guys and solving another card puzzle, we get to... Help! Help me! Hey little chef, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. Oh, Jesus! So it's gonna be like that, huh? Wait, before I go get revenge on that midget, I'm going to use this nickel to get some tokens. Hey, he's just minding his own business. Here, man, how about this? Take it. It's yours. Remember kids, don't drink alcohol. I told you, I told you this game was goofy.
But wait, it's about to get even goofier. A sec. I got a sec. What? Santa? I'm Santa Claus now. What is this game? Wait, now the midget isn't calling his friends to kill me. Because I'm wearing a Santa Claus outfit, does that mean that these zombies like Santa Claus and now they will be friendly towards me? Okay, guess not. In the previous game, everything was trying to kill you, including the house itself. In every room, there was some weird creature or set piece that could lead to your death. Here, instead of environmental hazards, there's just a million cowboy zombies with machine guns. Again, even the cultists from Blood warned this douchey, but don't worry, there are still some environmental traps waiting to murder you. This trident fork thing will chase you forever, but there's a really beautiful solution to this deadly predicament. You run away until the midget gets between you and the fork, then you make the fork hit him instead of you, and boom, you're not impaled, and you got some sweet revenge. And yes, the big chef just talked with us. Do you know that wine may open many a door? Maybe only the chefs believe in Santa, and that's why they don't attack us? He gives us a hint about some wine, but now the master chef is angry because we made the little chef die. So you slap his ass and steal his plate of fried eggs. That's uh, that's really something you can do. After finding the wine he was talking about and making enemies shoot each other, which is hilarious, we head upstairs. As you can see, the combat in this game has way more death than it did in the previous game. Really outstanding stuff. I managed to beat like 5 of them by doing this. Imagine if this game had a stamina bar, like in Dark Souls, and you would get tired after every swing. After beating zombies with a frying pan and having a duel with some wall hands, we combine the wine with some poison and lure out enemies so they will open this door. Why can't I take these guns? We use one of the tokens we got earlier to open this door. And now we got a bulletproof vest, which is the best item in the game, because it prevents you from being stunlocked, which is fucking amazing. The bad news is that it can break, but the good news? We can put it under our Santa costume. It's probably really hot wearing all of this stuff. After some more bullshit, we get teleported, and now we're fighting ninja zombies. We kill the ninja and the gangster zombie, and we finally get to where the little girl was. In the intro cutscene, she's long gone. But hey, at least the creepy clown is here. What is he doing? What are you doing? Get off, get off, get off. I guess he didn't die from that cup of water. He lost his eyes though. Obviously, the best and logical thing to do is to get a pump on and use it as a distraction for this clown and some snakes so that we can literally do a full Santa cosplay and fall down the chimney. Now, it's about to get even more goofy, but also more serious. We unlock a door, we go through it, and wow, it's actually dark in a game called Alone in the Dark. Prepare yourself for this beauty. By the horn of Beelzebub, the flying Dutchman was calling me. It was like honey to a bee. The enemy wanted to put an end to it. Its cannons spouted death. No matter. My ship was sinking, but my praise bridge flowed with blood. On this Xmas Eve of 1724, the cries of pain filled the air like the most glorious of hymns. The captain, one Nichols, told me to go to the devil. He died cursing me. You will die by my sword, Jack! Aha! <laughs> his sword remained stuck on the deck of his ship. The Flying Dutchman. My lieutenants greedily burst the locks of the hold. The crew seemed disappointed with the loot. But I knew we had taken the finest of all treasures. And in Elizabeth's eyes, I could read our destiny. And death became an illusion. I signed the pact, and so did my men. The Dutchman was ours. From then on, thousands of legends were being told about the Flying Dutchman. We hid here in 1824, but the cliff collapsed on our ship. 
And so our land flowed with blood. And we named our conquest Hell's Kitchen. A land with no past offered itself to us to guarantee our future. We built our mansion, and since then, we reign undisputedly! <laughs> this is One-Eyed Jack, the main antagonist. I'm not sure why he told us his whole life story instead of just killing us, but basically, about 200 years ago, he was just a normal pirate, riding along on the sea. One day, he felt like something was calling to him. So then, he boarded a ship called The Flying Dutchman! And then he murdered everyone there. He also saved a woman that by coincidence was a witch with immortality powers. So she made him and all of his men immortal. But that part about him dying by the captain's sword? Well, you'll see. I'll get deeper into the story later. Hey, it's that girl we need to rescue. She's just casually walking along like there isn't a zombie pirate standing next to her. After banging our heads against the wall, we use a hook to get out. I'm not sure why this works. Maybe because it's a hook and it's related to pirates and everything is pirate themed in these games. After escaping, we continue to search the house and... <laughs> hey, isn't that the lady from the intro cutscene? Oh god, this music. What? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why do you have telekinetic powers? <laughs> Choking me with the force is not the worst thing she did. She took my Santa outfit and now we play as... The girl? No, 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 It was bad enough being stunlocked to death while being a grown-ass James Bond knockoff. What am I supposed to do as a small defenseless child with big eyes? How did she even escape? Actually, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. It's a pretty short section. And if enemies see you, you just get cut. No stunlocking. But you are slow as fuck. This is my running speed. Well, it's not really running. More like skipping in a very carefree way. Okay, maybe I'm not defenseless. Look at these moves. Damn, that's scary. Especially this. Oh, and if you try to leave, this happens. At least they don't kill the girl. And I'm not sure they even kill Edward. He's just... he's just up there, swinging. They do seem happy though, good for them. What we need to do here is wait for this mobster to get into his car. Then we get inside of the trunk and ride for like 5 seconds. We Now, okay, it's hard to say this without laughing, but you, you need to sneak around here and I think you can say that this is the first 3D stealth game? <laughs> so this is not just the prototype for Resident Evil and survival horror games. Apparently it's also the prototype for Thief, Metal Gear Solid, Splinter Cell, Hitman, and every game that has a stealth mechanic. I'm kidding, of course. Or am I? You need to sneak up and grab another hook. Man, how many hooks are just lying around here? Do they fall off of their ends or something? Look at these advanced stealth techniques. They're dancing. I'm dancing. We all know how to have fun here. I like how there's a teddy bear in the inventory screen when you play as the girl instead of the cowboy when you play as Edward. Why does he have a cowboy there? This game is about mobster pirates. The cowboys are in the next game. Spoilers. After solving a puzzle, a zombie comes out of a tree and grabs us. We are cut and sent to where Edward is. Now it's time for the grand reveal. More than two centuries ago, Elizabeth Jarrett arrived in Haiti. I was then an innocent young girl. But Cotton, my tutor, taught me contempt. In hiding, a slave of his taught me to ride the shadows. Soon, the slave grew stronger than the master. Cotton felt the extent of my revenge and became my creature. The soldiers took us prisoner, but could they recognize Cotton? From then on, 
the Flying Dutchman was my jail. My spirit wandered. When I Jack heard my call for help, my soul guided him, and death is my ally. <laughs> He and his crew would become immortal, and every 100 years, an innocent girl would turn old for us. <laughs> A gust of freedom freshened my jail. Why do the villains like to tell me their life stories instead of just killing me? This game really is a James Bond parody. We look at our girl. Yeah, good job not tying up the girl. This lady kind of reminds me of Victoria from Fifth the Dark Project, but way less cooler. Basically this psycho bitch loaned some black magic and she was the one who gave Jack his immortality. But there's a catch. In order to keep their immortality, every 100 years they need to sacrifice a little girl. That's why they kidnapped this little girl. And I won't let her die. Because she has some funny dance moves. And it will be a shame to lose such talent. We continue to play as the girl and we use our stealth tactics to sneak around. We talk to a parrot. Rock! If it is the staff you're looking for, it has been hidden. What a bore! Rock! In the cavern of the one-eyed man, that's where you should seek it. If you can! Rock! If you please, do not sneeze! Rock! <coughs> Keep going and um, so, I think you're supposed to capture me. Now I'm just stuck like this. Oh, he's stuck too. <laughs> this game is actually not buggy at all, but occasionally stuff like this can happen. After sneaking around and grabbing some items, we use the world's smallest cannon to kill a pirate. Did I tell you that this game was silly? And no, you can't shoot yourself with the cannon. We make some chef's kiss and we make some enemies slip and die on ice cubes. I swear this is some Looney Tunes shit. The game does a good job pointing you in the right direction. At least in this part, it won't let you go where you're not supposed to. And that way you won't get lost and frustrated which is something I will complain about a lot in the next game. We do some more weird puzzles and we get cut again. Now we control Edward and we need to reach for the key. I actually thought that this was a cutscene at first and I just waited for something to happen. We're back to playing as Edward and we need to kill this. Why is this guy's sword broken? We're back to the shitty combat. But you know what? When the enemies don't have guns, it's kind of nice. It's kind of fun whacking them until they die. Now I don't need to hide like a little girl. I can actually kill them. Look at that skeleton. Stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them to wake up. Don't worry, I'll find a big alarm clock for all of you. We power up this cannon and blow everyone the fuck up. It's cool and satisfying and all, but we mainly did it to get some gold. Not because we're greedy, I mean, we are greedy, but the enemies are even greedier. So we use the gold to lure out some midget chefs so they will open this door for us. Come here, you're not getting away. After killing two tiny chefs, we kill one big chef who drops a jack of diamonds. I don't know why this game is obsessed with cards, but we use it on this door. Though I don't know how you're supposed to figure that out, I just randomly tried it. Oh no, it's the bitch in the purple dress. The girl just casually walks in. <laughs> I can't decide if I like this game or not. It's so wacky. We play as the girl again. We use the staff we got earlier to get to the lady and try to stop her. Yeah, I don't think you need an evil force field to block a tiny child. Unless she uses a chicken foot, which then obviously destroys the ancient evil, kills this bitch, 
and teleports the girl to a boat. I don't know what's going on either. There's some book that explains all of this, but still it's so stupid and bunkers. I mean, who cares about the explanation? I just used a chicken's foot to kill an ancient witch. Nothing can make me take this game seriously now, but it does make me love it. We take control of Edward again and head for the final battle. This is the final battle! We fight a bunch of pirates and of course we massacre them. There's even one with an accordion. Again. We even glide on a rope like a true pirate and fight a ninja pirate on a catwalk. I uh... Wow. This is actually epic. Remember that part about Jack dying by the previous captain's sword? Well, he wasn't wrong. We find that sword and we use it to kill Jack. Yes, he just showed up while we were fighting his men. He also managed to tie up the little girl. How did you do it so fast? It's time for an epic showdown. Just you and me. Let's go. Um... Am I winning? I'm not sure exactly how this happened, but I got this message and then everything blew up. What you need to do in this fight is run up to the cannon which then stops it from blowing everything up, somehow. Now the only thing left to do is kill him once and for all and get off this island. Take this and that, boom you're dead. Finally we can get out of here. Oh oh he's still alive, he's still alive. But it's okay because this dumbass accidentally blows himself up while we escape. <laughs> Ooh, look, it looks like a spooky face. Ooh, scary. Then, it ends. The game just ends. Where are your eyes? Well, this is certainly an ending. All of the fighting was actually really climactic and appropriate. I really like that final section. But then it just ends abruptly. But hey, at least they got away. The girl is safe and Edward... Edward needs to grow his mustache back. Okay, so... That was a weird game. After playing what is basically the first survival horror game, I was expecting a more horror-oriented experience. I definitely didn't expect this, but just because a game doesn't meet your expectations doesn't mean that it's bad. But... This is kind of bad. Even so, I am inclined to like this game. It has a really, really goofy tone, which I kind of like. And aside from the stun locking and occasional randomness in the puzzles, I did enjoy this game. The first one is probably my favorite out of the bunch, but in some ways I like this game even more. The puzzles weren't too frustrating and we got to do some wacky dance moves. It was kind of fun sometimes. My positivity ends here. Because Alone in the Dark 3 exists. I don't know if I'm the only one to feel this way. Maybe it was because I played this game right after I played the other ones and I got fatigued and tired, but this game really pissed me off. So I will mainly be complaining and talking about its bullshit. Remember Emily from the first game? Oh yeah, there wasn't a character selection in the second game, I forgot to mention that. You could only play as Edward in the second game, and it's the same here. But she is part of the story in this game. Remember how she and Edward never interacted with each other in any way, shape or form? Well, apparently they do know each other. In 1925, the first two games took place in 1924, so somehow everything that happened in these games took place in the span of one year. In 1925, Edward got a call informing him that Emily has been kidnapped. Carnby. Greg Saunders, Hill Century. Cut it short, Greg, I've got problems. You're onto a new case? 
No, not really, no. I'm alone in the dark. Hey, whoa, hey. He said it. He said it. He said the thing. The film crews disappeared. A thousand bucks plus expenses. Five hundred. Eight hundred. Conby, Emily Hartwood's out there. Yeah, your friend. She was part of the crew. Oh, then it's twelve hundred. Okay. Wait, did he ask for a thousand bucks, then lowered it? to 800 bucks and after hearing that his own friend was kidnapped he raised it to 1200 that's why you don't have any friends edward that's why nobody comes to your birthday parties this time there are different difficulty levels usually i like to play games under hardest difficulty but i think i'll stick with average I even considered choosing the easy difficulty, and I don't blame anyone who does choose this difficulty. We begin a new game, and we just start the game. There's no walking through a big mansion, there's no elaborate set piece. You just press start and voila, slaughter gulch, gulch. Yeah, this game will slaughter my sanity, and of course you can immediately fall to your death. Are those supposed to be the enemies celebrating my death? They haven't even met me yet. Can I leave? Oh shut up Edward, you're not really doing this for Emily, you're doing this for the $1200, which was probably a lot of money back then. Okay, there is a small set piece. Now we are trapped here, even though Edward should be able to jump across this bridge. He could jump so far back when he had a mustache, but now he somehow looks younger and he can't even jump. There's also this weird safe system that I didn't understand. California? Nevada? What is this? What's the point of dividing the safes into different states? I just always saved here, I don't know what the point of this is. This game really likes to complicate things, even the saving process. Oh, and if you try to go back before the set piece, then this happens. So now we actually start the game, and what is this bouncy music? God, it's so annoying. And what's worse, this is probably the most common track in the game. And why do I get one-shotted? I mean, it's realistic, kind of. But in the previous game, I could take like 50 rounds from a tummy gun. Here I die from one pistol shot. I barely even started the game and already I found so much to complain about. I'm usually a calm and nice person, friendly, kind. Sometimes I might burn your house down. But I mean, come on, who hasn't done that? But this game, ah, it drives me nuts. I have daily nightmares about the puzzles in this game. The game traumatized me. Especially because, in a baffling decision, they brought back the way you search and interact with objects. That thing when you need to choose search in the menu, and then you walk around like a disabled old person. They brought it back from the first game. Why? You already did it so much better in the second game. Just walk up to something and you pick it up, no matter if it's on the floor, on a table, or in a closet. Simple, classy, but no. Now you need to select the search option, walk up to something, press use, make yourself look like a dumbass, wait for like 3 seconds, and only then you can pick something up. It's like you're looking at things like a very curious caveman, but at the same time, there are items that you can pick up just by walking on them. So... I... Why? And why is there a guy shooting at me from above? Through the floor? I clearly got hit there, but I didn't lose any health. What? Even he's confused. He just leaves. There are a lot of things that I can nitpick in this game, but what really pissed me off are the puzzles. Again, I don't know if it's because I just played the previous games and I got fatigued, or I missed some notes, or maybe I'm just a big dum-dum. 
but man are these puzzles annoying. I know that adventure games use really asinine logic when it comes to puzzles, especially in point and click adventure games, but come on, I mean look at this. Okay, we throw a bottle in order to break it, so we can get what's inside, which is a token. That's fine, that's logical, that's something that also happened in the first game, but how are we supposed to know that we need to use that token and the piano to watch a slideshow? That's not the first thing that comes to mind about how to use a token. In the previous game we needed to use a token to open a door, which was also weird. And here, another example. This door is locked, but looking at it makes it and the door next to it open. How? And this part. Remember when you could suddenly jump in the first game? And it was the worst platformer ever? They brought that back as well, but whatever, it's not hard, as long as you quick save every time you make a successful jump. But then, you come to a dead end, you cannot progress. Unless, you randomly, maybe by trial and error, decided to use an Indian amulet here, which summons an old Indian man that brings you to the other side. How the fuck am I supposed to know that I need to use an Indian amulet here? How? <laughs> Did they pull me out of the lava just to beat me up? That's some dedication. And why is he the only one hitting me? Is the other one just lazy? Oh, and how can I forget about this part? You have to find a water pitcher and a candlestick in order to progress. Except, how are you supposed to know that you need to search here for them? Were they inside of the walls? This is worse than secret hunting in Wolf 3D. It's way too random. Now imagine this frustration for at least 90% of the game. But it didn't have to be this way. Some puzzles and encounters have hints and clues that are actually decent. Like these posters. They tell you how to deal with some of the enemies. They give you clues about their weaknesses. Wanted dead or alive Jim Burris alias Lone Miner. Reward $400. This coyote is so greedy, the only thing that can stop him is a golden bullet. Why does he sound kind of like Max Payne? And by that I mean James McAfee? It's not really him, but we will be hearing from him soon enough in these games. Also, almost all of the enemies turn into demonic cats when you kill them. Some turn into bats. There's also a floating rectangle. I give up. I do like the tense music that plays when you enter combat. You can also find a Gatling gun. That's something. That's cool. Also there's this guy that helps us. He even says that he's on our side. I don't know why, but... Thanks. Don't kill him. You will pay for it. I could go over all of the puzzles and tell you all how unfun they are, which I almost did, but that will take too long. Let's just talk about the story real quick. Danger! Beware of explosions! So there was this guy named Jed Stone, which sounds like a wrestler or porn star name. Jed Stone! He is believed to be the child of the bitch in purple and the pirate from the first game. I'm assuming that happened before he turned into a tree. Jed Stone and his buddies came to this town and slaughtered... Ah, slaughter Gulch, I get it. And slaughtered every single Indian that was there. Because that's what Americans do, I guess. They took over the town and started digging for treasure. Along the way, some of them turned into ghosts and zombies. Because that's a tradition at this point. Jetstone also became immortal. At least I think he's immortal. One day, Jet said to himself, Man, ruling over a ghost town is boring. Let's start the apocalypse. In order to do that, he needs a sacrifice, because that's also a tradition in these games. Someone has to be sacrificed by an immortal being. In the first game, it was the player character. In the second game, it was the little girl. And here, it's Emily. Apparently, she was in the movie industry. She came to this town to make some kind of film. The story in this game takes place like a hundred years ago. So the best they could make back then was a black and white gif of some cowboys dancing. Jet killed her crew and kidnapped her. He wanted to use her as a sacrifice to bring forward the apocalypse. But he also wanted to use her to get rid of Edward. 
for some reason. It looks like he knows who Edward is, and maybe he holds some kind of grudge against him, and he really wants him dead. Maybe he knew that Edward was good at stopping supernatural bullshit, and he wanted to kill him as soon as possible. Or maybe he wanted to get revenge on Edward for killing his lovely parents, even though the girl was the one who killed her with the chicken foot. <laughs> but using Emily worked, because Edward came to her rescue. Emily for the case and the key! Midnight at the water tank! Jed Stone! And eventually he manages to kill Edward by using Emily as a hostage. Yes, Edward actually dies. The main character, the protagonist of a video game, actually dies before the video game ends. That's quite surprising. Let us play the guessing game again. What do you think happened after he died? Is it A. The game just ends? Is the game over? B. Is the game over, but it's only one of multiple endings, and there's an ending where this doesn't happen, where Edward survives. Or it's C. You take control of Emily and you continue playing. It's time to choose! Did you choose? Did you make your choice? Well, once again, you are fucking wrong. It's actually option D. After Edward dies, a ghost of some Indian who was slaughtered here brings Edward back to life, but as a cheetah, or a mountain lion, or whatever this is. He brings Edward back as a big ass cat. How didn't you figure this out? It was so obvious. This is a cool little section. You move really fast and you attack with your claws. But only the idea is cool, because even here there are some annoyances. Your health is constantly ticking down, you can't really kill anyone, you can still be killed pretty easily, and there's this part where you jump across the stairs, which is great, you have improved mobility. But two seconds later, you fall down this hole, because suddenly you cannot jump across, which is super weird. But then you realize that, oh I'm sorry, for some reason, here and only here, I have to select jump in order to jump. But three seconds later, I can't select jump, and I can just do it by running, like I did on the stairs. Why are you doing this to me game? This is super confusing and inconsistent. This might seem like a small issue, but this is what I'm talking about. This is what pisses me off about this game. This happens all of that goddamn time, or at least that's how it feels. Then you fight a werewolf out of nowhere, but only a silver weapon can kill it. So you need to run away from it until you can dip your claw into some tar and silver salt. And now you can kill the wolf with your silver claw. But then I kill the second wolf with my normal claw. Oh what? Then the wolves turn into zombies, which then turn into demonic cats. You know, when I started playing a game called Alone in the Dark, I did not expect to go through a chase sequence as a lion. After finding and burning a golden crow, Edward is somehow resurrected in his own body. <sighs> the guy that was burying him shits his pants and runs away. This was actually bad ass. Good job Edward, look at him ready to fight. But wait, it gets even weirder. Two seconds later you discover that you have a doppelganger. But not like in Fear and Hunger, where they smile a lot and try to eat you. He will kick your ass if you try to fight him. He's way stronger than you. You have to show him that you're not hostile. And then you fuse together, like you have the Patara earrings. And the first thing Edward does after fusing with his green self is saying that he likes cowboys. I always dreamed of being a cowboy. Hmm. I think I would have a different reaction. Something like, oh shit, I just fused with myself, what the fuck is going on? Why was my doppelganger green? Or something like that. Unlike DBZ, this fusion doesn't make you stronger. I really have no idea what the point of it is. Being a cowboy is cool and all, it's not a Santa Claus costume, but it will do. This game is so random, I'm literally using things randomly, and sometimes it works. At least it seems like they had even more fun with the voice acting in this game. Me? The Force? 1865, 9.30 p.m. All uh, contact with the mountain ore causes irre irre irreversible mutations. The hydrogen in the mo 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 molecules is replaced by its ethos. 
it's it's so top. Uh, you do you do Tyrium. If, if that's true, then I'll soon be sitting beside Mr. Stone. Jed Stone! Again, random puzzle. If you step on the wrong area, you fall to your death. I have no idea how you're supposed to know where to go. Maybe according to this map? Somehow, I just did it with trial and error. Hi, guy. After some more bullshit, we get to this part. Why did you just drink it? You just put poison in it. And then you drink it for no reason. What? Why am I tiny? No matter how much I play these games, they never cease to amaze me with random crap. Nothing tells you to do this. Nothing tells you that this would happen. It is cool, I guess. We use our small stature in order to get to this cell with a zombie doctor and give him a needle shot. It's covered with poison, so it kills him. Again, random. Cool, but random. We get the key to the goal. I love these item names. There was also a really useful key in the previous game. Very informative. Let's just speedrun through the remaining puzzles and encounters. You use a piece of straw to get to a zombie spider thing. You shrink it and crush it. Do not touch the spider webs. Then you see Jed and he starts shooting at you. You then climb on a wall like your Spider-Man and you face off against a big headless zombie. You pick up his head, which is just sitting there, and then you... Did you just die from a 2 meter fall? You pick up his head and throw it. You tell him to go fetch, and he literally does it. Okay, you know there are people out there that genuinely believe that this is a horror game. After that, you fight against a martial artist ninja zombie, similar to the ones in the previous game. But this time he fucked up. He brought martial arts to a gunfight. Finally, we get to Jed himself. But he runs away like a pussy. Don't worry, Emily. I'll save you. <laughs> Wait, I get why they put Edward here. But where did they put Emily? Eh, they probably killed her. This is too kinky for me. We managed to free Emily, but she goes to sleep, so now we need to fight this guy. But after we defeat him, we get crushed by spikes. So we do it again, but this time, we managed to wake up Emily. Ah, shit. We managed to wake up Emily, and she... Yeah, no, take your time. It's not like I'm about to be spiked to death. Final boss time. We don't just fight Jed, we also fight against these dickheads. These immortal dickheads. You can see them in the very beginning where they can one shot you. They've been terrorizing me throughout the whole game and you could never kill them. And it's the same here, you cannot kill them here. And on top of that, Jed has a mech suit. How does he have a mech suit? This is 1925, goddammit. And why do they teleport while burping? The only way to defeat them is to use the evil wand with a mineral tip. Man, these item names are really informative. This causes the hack to have green eyes, which then kills them. Wait, wait, I... I need a drink. Now it's just Jed, but like I said, he has a goddamn mech suit. Shooting him is out of the question. So how about a little bit of electricity? That was not what I meant. Let's use the glove this time. The glove that's just lying around here. We cut some electric wires and turn on the water. I don't know why he's searching for me over there when he saw me running here. But even his mech suit can deal with 10,000 volts. The spirits of the damned push his body into the electrified water, and he gets shocked to death. This was actually a really climactic fight. The music makes this fight even better. It 
It makes you feel like the apocalypse is really coming and you have to put everything on the line. Just don't forget to pick this item up. It's funny to think that if this fight took place anywhere else, we would have no chance of winning. We only won thanks to some electric water and Indian ghosts. <clears throat> we find Emily and use a train to finally leave this fucking place. This game, this fucking game, I'm not sure what to say at this point. The story is cool, but nonsensical, but that's every game in this franchise. There were some cool moments here, but the puzzles, the randomness, the lack of direction, ah, I'm tired of complaining about it. The only real good thing I can say about this game is that it handles enemies' attacks way better than the other games. For the most part, it doesn't put you through stun like hell. Enemies have bigger delays between each of their attacks, so you actually have a chance of attacking them or avoiding them before they can attack again. That's a really big deal. Also, like in the second game, you never get to a point where you have a full inventory and you need to make a big pile of items, like in the first game. The music and sound effects are good, sometimes even really good, the animations are good, also, this game has the most climactic final boss fight, so that's something I guess. I think that if you could combine all of the good aspects of each game, you will get a really solid and fun survival horror game. Or even just a really fun action game that isn't frustrating and confusing. But at least these games have the greatest combat we will ever see in our entire existence. No matter how much these games might annoy me, I have a newfound respect for the protagonist. I had no idea Edward Carnby was such a badass. He took down an entire haunted mansion with his stupid kicks. He burned an ancient tree pirate. He killed like a thousand zombie gangsters and another ancient pirate. Then he took down the entire Wild West, died, came back to life, turned into a fucking mountain lion, fused with his cowboy self and took down immortal cowboys and a mech suit. Now that's quite a big list of achievements. Not a lot of characters can compete and he's supposed to be just a regular human. But the real issue is the name. I like the name Alone in the Dark. It really fits a horror game. But if you think about it, 99% of the time it's not dark at all. It's actually super bright. But I guess calling it Super Bright Adventures of Captain Mustache wouldn't sound so spooky, especially because he only has that mustache in the first game. Oh, about an hour ago, I said that I've played all of the Alone in the Dark trilogy, but also another small game. This is what I was talking about, Jack in the Dark. It was used as a promotional game and was released just before Alone in the Dark 2. It's like a 10 minute game and it goes places. It's wacky as hell. We play as the little girl from the second game, the one with the funny moveset. I know you missed her, but unfortunately she cannot dance here or make that stupid face. Instead, she has a broom. She dressed up for Halloween, but got lost in the big city and ended up locked in the store. <laughs> Just shrugs it off. Now we need to find a way to get out. Look! It's One-Eyed Jack from the second game. Jack coming out of the box. Jack in the box. I get it. Anyway, it's the usual gameplay. Walk around, explore, collect items. The major difference is there's no combat here. 
No one is attacking the little girl, but some enemies can make her cry. They will pay. The story is... Bunkers. And I love it. This Jack in the Box somehow kidnapped Santa Claus, and only a witch can save him, which is her. You can find a book in a trash can which tells you about the history of the toys in this toy shop, and also about their weakness. The drums. It also tells you that the only way to defeat Jack is to give him candy and show him his own reflection. No, not this one. You explore, make a toy slip and die, make some other toys go inside of a chest, give these guys a present, and in turn they give you a present, which is the specific candy you need. I found that if you use the mirror, after he finishes his eating animation, then nothing will happen, and you're basically locked out of the ending. You have to use the mirror during his eating animation. And then this happens. He disappears. Santa is free. And he even left you a present. You go outside and wave goodbye. A little girl just accidentally got locked in a toy store and ended up saving Santa Claus on Halloween. That's neat. I don't think that ever happened to me. This was a fun little side quest. Even though it also had some randomness to it, I still liked it. The premise alone is wholesome and goofy enough for me to like it. <sighs> Overall, these games are... fine? They have their moments. The stories are silly but intriguing, and of course, like I said, and like a lot of people have said, these games shaped the gaming industry in more ways than one. I think it's worth taking a look at them if you're interested in the survival horror genre and how it originated, or if you're the kind of person who really likes adventure games, and also really likes solving puzzles with fucking moon logic. But if not, then unfortunately, I wouldn't recommend playing them. They're not really fun, and you could use the time you would have wasted on them to pet your cat, or do something crazy, like go outside and touch grass. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't look at them as games. Look at them as artifacts in a museum. They are super important, but maybe you don't really need to touch them. Can't you see the sign? I think I've rambled long enough. Next time, we'll be looking at the fourth game, Alone in the Dark, A New Nightmare. I really, really hope it's not going to be a nightmare. I've had enough of them for now. This took me a long time to make, too much time to make, so I really hope you enjoyed this. Maybe you've gained some appreciation for these games, or maybe parts of the video made you laugh. Thanks for watching, here's a cat video. When the darkness closed in, I was alone in the dark.